Yo, 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 welcome back to the Wrestling Strength Podcast. As always, I am your host, Coach Myers, and the Wrestling Strength Podcast is brought to you by Max Effort Muscle. Make sure you go to maxeffortmuscle.com for all your supplement needs. I trust it for all my athletes. I trust it for you. MaxEffortMuscle.com. Get after it, baby. Let's go. All right, guys, I got a very special guest with you today. I'm very excited to uh, kind of share the microphone stage with this guy. Now, uh, before I introduce who he is, I'm going to tell you, I've, I've known this guy for a long time. I was lucky enough to be colleagues with him. We worked together at Ohio State, you know, a few years back. And the best way that I can describe this guy is there's certain things that I know a lot about. And I also kind of pride myself on knowing a little bit about just about everything. This guy is a guy that I feel like knows a lot about just about everything. All right. So <laughs> without further ado, I want to, you know, introduce you to my friend, sports scientist, and also, if we go way back, 1985 Big Ten champion for the Ohio State Buckeyes, my man Don Moxley. Thank you very much. And But the the, the relevant term would be the 1985, 1980 OVAC champ. That's right. Okay, so now, both Valley boys. We're, we're going way back there to the OVAC. And at, at that time, for any of you OVAC, OVAC wrestlers out there, listen, you'll know, like at that time, the OVAC was considered – maybe one of the premier wrestling terms in the entire country. Certainly the largest. Yeah, certainly the largest. Yeah. At one time it was the largest. So forget about Iron Man, forget about Brexville, forget about the Doc, Doc B out in yeah, California. Yeah. It was the OVAC. Yeah, yeah, it was it was big back then. I mean, it was three, what, what two states? Was there yep. a, th- no, there's, yeah, there was no. Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Ohio. Um, but it was a, it was a great tournament. You had a, you had a 32 man bracket with pigtails. Uh, you, re- you wrestled a lot in the OVAC. Now, so did you win it your senior year? Was that the only senior time you year. won it? Yeah, only time. Yeah, yeah. Now, back then, I cut. So my that senior year, I cut from about 210 to 175. Finished, did the first half of the season at 185 because that, that first part of the cut was just yeah, too yeah. much. Finally got, I had to certify at 175 in January. And so got the 175. And you also got a weight allowance there. So I don't think I ever weighed 175 except for like the first day of the state tournament. But uh, it was like 178 was the scratch weight because you got weight throughout the season. So this was your pre-heavyweight days. Now, I'm, now you won the Big Ten as a heavyweight. Right. I'm actually amazed that you were ever at any time not a heavyweight because you're a big guy. I mean, look at your, your wrists, your hands, your yeah. calves. You're not a small – like I'm kind of a little human. Like, yeah, I got some muscles or whatever, but I'm a small human. My right. bone structure is very small. You're a, a big human. I can't well, believe that you ever weighed 175. Yeah, and this is back, listen, this is back before I knew sports science. This is back, you know, this this is the late 70s. Mm-hmm. Um, we thought to be a good wrestler, you had to cut weight. We thought that was part of the part of the answer. That, that's still most of the parents I deal with, but go ahead. And it's a huge problem. <laughs> um, and so I'm a decent high school wrestler, uh, was able to walk on at Ohio State, uh, walked on, tried to wrestle 177 my freshman year, um, cut from about 220, 225, made 177, uh, practiced a total of 15 days, tore a knee up in practice, was basically done that year, came back the next year. We had a returning All-American at 77 in Ed Podicar, so I knew there wasn't a uniform there for me. So cut from about 230, 240 to 190, uh, did twice as well that year, practiced 30 days, tore up the other knee, and had been in school for two years, uh, hadn't really bought into the academic thing yet. Knew I, you know, but I wanted to wrestle and started asking questions. You know, what's it take? And the answer was, you got to get strong. Um, now, ironically, through some connections and you know, with all the stuff that's happened recently, one of my teammates, one of my best friends' roommate, was a guy by the name of Kevin Akins, who had the third longest shot put in the world at the time. Um, and he says, you want to get strong, I'll show you where to get strong. And he drags me over to, uh, Lou Simmons' garage. Um, so literally, and so we have a strength coach at Ohio state. I'm getting introduced to Lou Simmons. At the time, no one knows who Lou is. There was no West side. Right, right. Right. It was just the garage that we've seen. I've seen pictures of it. I think on, you know, maybe on Instagram or something. It was like, it was a garage or it was down under a a house or something. Well, he was in his base, but the The garage had a power rack made out of round steel tubes. Um, so it wasn't even square steel, it was round steel. And and instead of doing the back hyper machine, you'd get up on this rack. They had boards with a pad on it and you'd strap 25 pound plates between your ankles. Um, and you do back hypers like that. So it was, it was, this was some of the original influence I got. This is 1983. I had another, uh, uh, 
a mentor who was tied into Nautilus Midwest down in Cincinnati. So he was connected to that group. So I'm so I'm getting this this powerlifting feed from from Lou and the West Side guys. I'm getting this high intensity feed from the guys at Nautilus Midwest and 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 the high intensity the, you were seeing the emergence of high intensity training at that time. And then we're at Ohio State, so we have a third group coming in. So you, listen, it was a wonderful learning experience for me. But the bottom line is I got strong, and when I got strong, I became a heavyweight, and I got good. I love it. I, I don't even think I knew the, the backstory of you training with Louie back in the day. You, you may have mentioned before. Training I, training's a strong word. I, I you, learned from Louie. You learned from him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I Listen, this is the Matt Dimmel days. If you watch West Side versus the World, this is pre-multi-layer uh, 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 clothing. Um, this was pre that. So we were, our squat suits were single layer. They were, they were a thick wrestling singlet. So, mm -hmm. um, so you were wrapping and things like that, but we weren't into the real powerlifting suits yet. Um, well, the sport was kind of in its infancy mm -hmm. in, in the U S you know, compared to what it is now. Well, and, and listen, I'd go over there and here's Matt Dimmel and a bunch of other guys cycling through doing thousand pound doubles. And I'm like, okay, you know, you're not in <laughs> Kansas anymore here. This yeah, is yeah. a different place. So, well, I'll tell you what, um, so, you know, kind of transitioning away from, you know, uh, your Ohio State career for a second, you mm -hmm. know, later on you got deep into the sports science side of things after you got out of college, all right? Yeah, I became a professor. So, you know, coming out of Ohio State, I was working in the, in the fitness industry, but I also was invited to teach some courses down at Columbus State. So I went down to Columbus State and um, started teaching in the exercise science program and um, and and essentially became an, either an assistant or an adjunct professor uh, for, for the rest of my career for the most part. So I've taught 25 of the last 35 years. At the same time, have always kept a foot in the industry. I've always worked with an elite group of athletes. Um, you know, back then, uh, uh, someone calls me when I'm running a small health club up on the north side of Columbus. This is 86, 87. Uh, I get a call and it's the guys at Ohio State says, hey, uh, Dennis Hobson, who at the time was the, the previously was the NCAA player of the year from Ohio State and Brad Sellers, who was a six, seven foot center on that team, same age as I was, graduated in 85. They were playing for the Chicago Bulls. And this is the Jordan Bulls that you see. And I get a call from Al Vermeil, who's the strength coach there. And he says, hey, I heard you're the guy that we need to have train our guys in Columbus. So, so in 18, 87, 88, 89, I get to work with, with Al Vermeil from the Chicago Bulls. This guy's in two different uh, professional Hall of Fames, both NBA and NFL. NFL with the 49ers, NBA with the Bulls. So I'm getting, you know, there's a great lesson, right? Working with someone like that. Um, and then and then started teaching about the same time. So, you know, so I've, I've, I've never gone down one pathway. I've always had a couple going at the same time. Teaching, working with elite athletes, and working in the industry, uh, particularly technology as it relates to fitness. Well, I'll tell you what, so while I got you here, I want to kind of take advantage of this. I want to pick your brain a little mm -hmm. bit about some stuff that I think will benefit, you know, everyone that's listening, but also too, just for my, my own benefit, some stuff that I'm interested in sure. right now. You know what? We talked a little bit when you first came in, I have recently started doing a fasting protocol. Mm -hmm. All right. So now I, I, I know a little bit about it on the surface, but I want to learn a little bit more in depth. You know, it's kind of the cellular benefits of, of it. Okay. So for me, what I'm doing is I'm doing a 18 hour fasting mm -hmm and a six hour feeding window. Right. Basically doing two big meals, and I'm snacking a little bit in between, and then I try to cut it off at six hours. I give myself a little bit of leeway, because I know typically people go like 18 and six. Do you ever do you ever skip a meal and, and go from, and throw, go like two days? I have not, I've not done that yet. Yeah, it's, so it's, it, it, it's easy. Once you get a good solid 18, six in place, yeah, yeah. you basically skip a six hour feeding window one day, mm -hmm. and you're two days in, which is, which is, oh, there's a little, there's benefit there. So, so from like an autophagy standpoint, you say that's where the benefits come. Well, actually first explain that process. So th this is where the value is. Okay. You know, a lot of people talk about, oh, I fast because I want to lose weight or I fast because I want to, you know, detoxify. I'm, I'm not sure what detoxify means. Right. I do know. <laughs> what autophagy means so autophagy the, it's latin for self-eating that's what that's what the word comes from and this is very recently well understood they just gave a nobel prize in 2016 
to a Japanese researcher that really described the autophagy process. Um, and what autophagy is, it's, your cell, it's a cellular process where your cells recognize, hey, there's no energy coming in from the outside, but we still need to be cells. We need to do what we do, you know, make proteins and reproduce and those things. So let's, instead of waiting for food to come in, let's go internal and clean ourselves up. Because when our cells make proteins, they don't make them all correct all the time. So there will be the buildup of proteins and cells that are no longer valuable. Well, the process of autophagy helps you go in and clean that out um, and, and it breaks those proteins up. And then when you start to look at it older in life, when you look at dementia or Alzheimer's. That, that was exactly what I was thinking about. You yeah. talk about the proteins that accumulate in the brain and stuff. This is exactly where you're going after. And, and so that's the one that's just most recognizable to mm -hmm. us, right? But those exist in a lot of other organ systems as well. But certainly there's a huge value when you take a look at people who fast on a regular basis this this protein recycling it also in your cell you have what's called mitochondria these are the little parts of your cell that make energy they're the powerhouse of the cell they're i remember the, that from a science class from, yep that, they're the powerhouse <laughs> of the cell well mitochondria has its own dna um it doesn't even work from the dna from your nucleus it has its own dna that came from your mother but mitochondria wear out and what you want to do is you want to be digesting the old mitochondria and get them out of play so the new ones are always regenerating based on stimulus. And again, when you start looking at, you know, I now work in an industry that's more focused towards longevity than athletic performance uh, based on some things that have happened in the last few years. But when you look at longevity, you don't die when you run out of time. You die when you run out of energy. And everything you should be doing at some point in time, and this is where it carries over back to the work we're doing at Ohio State. When you look at elite athletics, the athlete that can generate the most energy wins. Right. Um, so, so there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, consistencies here between elite athletics and 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 good longevity, and that goes back to that mitochondria. And autophagy is an important part of that, particularly as you get older, because that autophagy process tends to decline. So let me ask you this. So during the fasting process, autophagy starts to accelerate, correct? It upregulates, exactly. It upregulates. Okay, yep. so what is kind of, have they determined, or do you, are you familiar, what is the breaking point? Like, all right, when it's only been six hours since you ate, like you're not, like- We don't know it, yet. We don't know, okay. Well- And is there a certain point where it becomes like, okay, a, a 16 hour fast is not as valuable as an 18, which is not as valuable as a 24 or whatever. We don't know. Cause one of the things we do that, that's challenging right now that our company is actually working very hard on is trying to come up with a good autophagy metric. You know, we can't draw blood and say, Oh, you're deep in autophagy or you're not. Those markers just aren't there to measure autophagy. We actually have to take cells out and we count the parts of the cell or, or the, the organelles that, that come from autophagy. So we have to go, you know, we have to get an electron microscope to look at the pieces so, of the cell. So for the average person, there's no way for them to ever know whether the autophagy is actually. No, but there, there is a good, there is a good uh, parallel marker, uh, proxy marker, and that is ketosis. Okay. So we know when we're in ketosis, we're probably upregulating autophagy. Now, the company I work for now is based in Austria, and we have a lot of great scientists on our advisory board. And I just sent this question over them the other day. I'm waiting to get the answer back. Is that, you know, as a proxy measure, can you use ketosis as a tool? And we can measure ketosis relatively easily. There's, you can use blood, you can use urine, or you can use breath. Um, I tend to go towards breath and blood, not urine. My wife calls it hungry steak breath. You know, it's like yeah, when you, when yeah, you have yeah. this hungry steak breath, you're in, in ketosis. Absolutely. You're in <laughs> ketosis, but you, and you can measure it. There's, there's, there's a linear relationship right. there. So using a ketone analyzer, um, breath or using a blood analyzer, um, these are good tools to measure ketosis and you can proxy uh, autophagy from that. But would you say then that, it's 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 a safe bet to say, hey, if I'm on this 18 and six schedule, then I'm probably upregulating into autophagy. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And then and does that process stop once you break your fast and have your first meal? It doesn't stop. It downregulates. Okay. Okay. So it slows back down. Yeah, and you got to remember. So everything the human body likes cycles. We mm -hmm. have a circadian rhythm. We have we have so many cycles. Um, and when you start taking a look at when you're in autophagy, you are in a catabolic, you're eating cycle, you're breaking things down, you're cleaning the cell out. 
Whereas when I'm eating and I'm getting signaling to the cell, either from glucose through via insulin or proteins via IGF, that's telling the cell to, hey, make more proteins. Um, there's, there's actually a marker in the cell. There's a protein that's called mTOR. Um, so as you eat either glucose or proteins, it signals the cell mTOR sees this and says, okay, let's go ahead and start making things as autophagy goes up, as we fast and energy available goes down, mTOR down regulates. So this is part of that cycle that you want when mTOR is cranking all the time, it's making protein, but it's making some bad ones too. Okay. Um, and you know, if you're young, if you, you know, if you're a young football player trying to gain weight, things like that, you're probably going to be fine. Knock yourself out, eat every two hours, you know, do what you, you know, what everyone recommends. But as you get older, you want to think about, okay, longevity. I want to know who I am when I'm 60. Um, yeah, and- absolutely. I mean, I, I still train with these young guys and maybe train like, I'm you know, 22 or 23, but I'm, I'm about to be 43. Right. I always look at it as like, I'm, I'm in the second half now. I need to be concerned with longevity, not just how hard can I work every day or how much protein can I eat every day? I need to make sure that I'm eating things so that my body operates well. Yeah, you're not quite second half. What's interesting <laughs> about this, what's interesting about so we'll talk about that, but um, there's a really good book out there that's called um, uh, by David Sinclair, I'm blanking on it. I'll think about the name here as we go. But there's actually a set of genes in your cell. They're called the sirtuin genes Mm -hmm. that actually move. They move from the nucleus out to the cytoplasm as you move from reproductive phase to longevity phase. Um, And and so that's kind of first half, second half. So if you can still reproduce, you're still first half. Okay. Gotcha. Now I think of I, I, I might be surgically impaired from reproducing, well, but, but you, yeah, you know what I mean. But <laughs> I think of I think of long I think of life in thirds. We okay. spend the first third of our life learning. We spend the second third of our life in service to others, work, family, things mm-hmm. like that. Now my wife and I, we have a daughter who moved out of our home January second of this year. My wife and I entered our third third. We it's now just us. Okay. It's back to just us. And I want this third third to be long and vigorous. I want to enjoy myself over this third. You know, I turned 60 on my next birthday. Um, and I want to, you want to look at 70 and 80 feeling the same way 60 does not a a gradual. I want to, I want to do 70 and 80 the way I felt at 40. Okay. And this is a challenge. You know, there, there's things that listen, I'm still pretty strong. I can still do, I, I, I listen, if a fight breaks out, I'm not backing down. I may not start it anymore, but I'm not backing down. Um, and, and I, you know, we're moving right now. We're moving out of our home. Um, I've moved all the furniture in our home by myself. Um, so I've not had to, I've not had to get help there. So I'm still, I can still do some things. Um, I can still pick up some pretty heavy stuff. I can still, again, if a fight broke out, I'm not backing out of it. Um, and I want to be like that. I'll tell you a funny story that you'll appreciate. My nephew qualified for the Florida State Championships. Uh, this has now been almost three years ago. It was a year after, it was 19. Um, and I got to go to Florida, and he's a heavyweight. He's a big kid, 285. He's playing Division One football now. Um, but a big kid. We look mm-hmm. a lot alike. I got to wrestle with him. I got to train with him for a day. I brought my wrestling shoes down and wrestled. And you know what? I've, I, I, I had it. I, I, could still, I could still probably beat him. Second day, <laughs> not a chance. Okay, but um, I want to. I want to be that crazy granddad that trains kids and trains with them when I'm 80. Well, I think you know you've kind of hit the nail on the head here. If you want to be able to even have have those thoughts of like still being able to do these things, still be able to move your own furniture, still be able to wrestle with your nephew and eventually your grandkids stuff, you have to focus on nutrition. You have to focus on recovery. You have to fo- focus on longevity overall. Mm-hmm. You know. My dad will turn 69, I think he's 68 right now, so he'll turn 69 in September. He still works out every day. He hits the bag two or three days a week. He still jogs a couple days. Now he jogs a lot slower than he used right, to. Right, right, which still, is fine. Yeah, and he, he don't lift as heavy as he used to or anything like that, but he still he still does all this stuff. Well, you know, last time, maybe time before last when I was home, we were out there doing a boxing workout. He's like, hey, Dust, I've been working on this move. You know, watch, when I, if I pull this leg back and, you know, like basically show me a setup on the bag for this hook and, He's telling me, you know, he's working on this new move in case he has to, like, get in the fight. I said, Dad, you're almost 70 years old. What are you ever going to get in another street fight for? Yeah. He said, well, I just got to stay ready. But that's the way he thinks. And I think that as long as we think that way, you know, it doesn't matter. Hopefully he never gets another right, fight right. again. But, you know, he's trying to live his life so that he can still, if he had to, he can. Listen, you know? I, I, I think so much of life is about being prepared. 
you know, yeah. for whatever comes. And, and we don't know what's going to happen. You know, a, a tornado comes through, blows your house down. You got to get out of it. There, there's, there's any number of things that can happen that you need to be physically capable of reacting to. Um, I absolutely want to be there. You know, we just had a situation. My mother passed away two years ago. She was 85 years old and she did hospice in our home. Um, and I, I distinctly remember about six years ago flying out to um, Arizona to see my mom. And my mom was one of the strongest people I ever knew. My, she knocked my brother out with a hook when he was a <laughs> sophomore in college. She, he said something. She wheeled on him. And he woke up with his head in a cow pie. Um, and I, I mean, she was a beast. Well, I remember flying out to see her in Phoenix uh, six or seven years ago. And I started to see the hunch coming. She was having trouble stepping. I'm like, Damn it, mom, you have got to get in and get lifting. Lifting is critical throughout the life cycle. You know, we have so many, you know, there's so many kids, you know, kids you train, that, that, you know, your gym's full of young people. Truth is the gym should be of those people, full of those people's parents. That's where, this is where healthcare comes into play. This is where longevity comes into play. Your dad's got it figured out. Um, you have to make strength, part. strength and movement is what I, what I consider one of the four big rocks to longevity. Um, so yeah, I would say we, we don't grow old. We let ourselves get old. Absolutely. You know, and I think that's as, as true, you know, physically it is as mentally as well. Absolutely. Well, and we live, the, the, the challenge is, is that we have a DNA that evolved for change. Uh, you know, the thing that gave homo sapiens, our ancestors, the ability to get past Neanderthals was our ability to change based on seasons. Our body likes change. But we live in static environments now. I call them aquariums. If you look at if you look at an orca, a killer whale that is in an aquarium like at SeaWorld, what you'll see is their dorsal fin bends over, whereas orcas in the wild have a straight dorsal fin. So there's not enough environmental force on the orca in the aquarium for it to express its its DNA. And if you look at zoo animals, you know, the old zoos that were concrete blocks and bars, you know, those animals lived an average of three and a half years. They were neurotic. They had digestive problems, much like your neighbor. Um, and when you look at that, when you put them in an enriched environment, they live full lives, they reproduce. Well, the question is, is what aquarium do you live in? Because you're in one. Yeah. We, we go from our house aquarium to our car aquarium to our work aquarium. We don't, we don't have temperature change. We, you know, we have, we have heating and air conditioning. It keeps the house at the same. We don't climb. We don't have to, we don't have to exert ourselves. So just the, the natural evolution of society has created an environment that's contrary to our DNA. We have to feed that DNA. You do it with strength. You do it with training. You do it with good food. You do it with light. You do it with sleep. You know, those are the four, those are the four key elements that you've got to focus on. Kyle, that's what we call some gut check wisdom right there. That's a, that's a clip we're going to have to break off and put on social right there. That was a good one. All right, so I'm going to kind of switch gears a little bit because there's something I want to get into a little is I want to have you kind of talk a little bit about endurance training, about heart rate stuff. So mm -hmm. something I've always been a cardio, a cardio guy, always a conditioning guy. You know, something I've been guilty of in the past is I, my mindset is always like, all right, if I'm going to go out and run six miles today, I'm going to run that six miles as hard as I can. Right. I'm going to say, this is, my, this is the pace I have to beat, and I'm going to go as hard as I can. Same thing if I'm doing one mile, same thing if I'm doing, if I'm doing 40 minutes on the bike. It's hard. It's been a process for me to be able to say, you know what? Everything doesn't have to be max effort. Right. You know, there's day there's days where maybe my sprint works max effort, or even if I'm doing, you know, that whatever I'm doing for 20 minutes is max effort or whatever, but that doesn't mean every day has to be like that. And what I've found is since I've started kind of trying to be a little bit more strategic about, okay, I because I, I do some type of conditioning every day. Right. Maybe, maybe it's you know GPP stuff, maybe it's running, maybe it's biking, it varies based on the day. But all right, if I'm conditioning seven days a week there might be only two days where I'm going to empty the tank. Right. And those other days in between, I want it to be, I have to, I have to pull it back a little bit. So this is something that even, you know, some you know, talks that you and I had in the, the staff room at OSU a few years back kind of helped me kind of start to see that because like, we got to look at like, we got to think about overtraining and kind of the big picture, especially when we're dealing with these athletes. If, I, if I'm overtrained, it's not as big of a deal. If they, these athletes are overtrained, it's a bigger deal. Now for me, I just feel like for longevity's sake, it is a big deal for me not to overtrain. So why don't you maybe kind of touch on that? I know I'm kind of putting a lot under this right, one right. umbrella here, but kind of touch on that and talk about maybe, you know, how, because I see it sometimes with some of my athletes where like, all right, they're going to go out and they're going to, you know, if I tell them, hey, I want you to run four miles 
on the weekend, but I want you to run it easy. But then I'll look in Strava and look at their time. I'm like, well, I know that's not an easy pace for them. Right. You know right. what I mean? So maybe kind of touch on that stuff a little bit. So I think, listen, it's important to look at this, not through the eyes of a physiologist, but look through this as economics, return on investment, that we only have so much time. You only have, you know, as, as in, from, a, from an investment standpoint, you have so much money. So you got to make decisions. Where do I get my best return on investment? And when you start looking at conditioning, developing cardiovascular fitness, the ability of those mitochondria to make energy is really important. So the question is, where do you get your best return on investment on building that energy production? Well, when you think of exercise, I'll, I break it into five zones. So the, the, bottom, the bottom of the first zone is rest. You and I are sitting slightly above rest right now. And then when you go out and run a 400 meters, you're at max. Okay, if you, that's, that's the range. Mm -hmm. Well, we break that into five zones. Um, so, and now the important break point in this comes at the top of zone three, going from zone three to zone four. Zone three is a fully what we call aerobic zone, meaning that I'm challenging my mitochondria, I'm challenging my system to make energy, but I'm not challenging it so much that I'm beginning to accumulate lactic acid. Which would be, we'd be kind of going into anaerobic at that point. When you start to accumulate lactic acid, you're starting to get into the anaerobic space. And the challenge with anaerobic space is when you make lactate, you're not just making lactate, but you're also telling the system, hey, I'm under stress here. And it begins to create cortisol. So cortisol is a stress hormone. Um, and so when you're making lactate, you're also creating cortisol. And cortisol is going to be affecting your ability to recover. Now, if I train at the top of zone three, I'm able to fully challenge the mitochondria. I'm able to fully challenge the respiration system. I'm able to f give a stimulus that tells that system, hey, adapt here. But at the same time, I'm not creating a stress response. And this is a really important point. And, and actually, in, at the top of zone two, there's a huge mitochondrial benefit. And then when you go to zone three, you're starting to see the changes in some of the enzymes and the develop of the of the of the processes that make energy. So those upregulate to a certain degree. But when we go to zone four, I'm not getting any more benefit cardiovascularly. None. Okay. All I'm doing is getting the same benefit as below, but I'm also producing cortisol. So you're getting no more bang for your buck, but you're getting more of the the bigger downside risk. Right. Okay. It's like investment. Okay. Now you have to train in zone five. You've got to go into zone five from time to time. You've, and if you think about this from an evolutionary standpoint, uh, you went to zone five for one of two reasons and they related to lunch. Okay. Yeah, fight or flight, right? Fight or flight. I go around the corner and there's a lion. And if I don't have a good enough zone five, I'm the lion's lunch. But if I'm out walking around the plains and I go around the corner and I see a rabbit, and I don't have a good enough zone five, I go hungry, okay? So this, so zone five is a good place. When you're in zone four, your body's thinking, okay, there's a line still chasing you, okay? We gotta give you everything we need and there's a stress response with that. And you've got to recover. Um, and again, back then we climbed up into a tree and we spent the day there chilling out. Well, now we live in our aquariums. We have a lot of false stimulus we have a lot of false paper lions whether it's a study or a paper or a relationship or things like that that are causing these cortisol responses that you don't need to do it with exercise too and so the, this is where this cardiovascular training zone and and you can't see it dustin this is the challenge when you go out running you typically run till you feel it well you're feeling you're feeling lactate you're feeling lactate, and there's going to be a nice little dopamine response. There's, you know, there's the, mm -hmm. the body says, hey, this, this is a good thing to do, but you don't, you can't feel it. You can't see it unless you're wearing a heart rate monitor. Um, and that's where that technology comes into play. And, and you remember, we spent a lot of time yeah, looking yeah. at this. All right. So, and just to kind of give people an idea, all right. So you talked about that zone five, that's your 400 meter. That's your max effort sprint. It's, it's sprinting. Yeah. yeah sprint, yeah, so recover, sprint, yeah. recover, sprint, recover. Exactly. Um, in true sprinting. Okay. So let's use this as an example. Let's say if I'm running 400s and I run a 400, then I do, you know, say it's a, it's a one minute 400. Now I, I'm resting six minutes or whatever in between. Right. That's true sprint work. If I'm running a 400 now at 115, but I'm only resting 115 in between then 
That's going to take me down into zone four. You're going to be, you're, you'll be lit, your zone five will go away because you'll have so much lactate buildup that, that you, you can't, can't get there. Hard. That you can't get there. So it's about going from zone five to zone three, even zone two. I mean, some of the best interval work is recovering to zone two. Okay. Um, so yeah, and this is where this is where having tools to f- to provide feedback. Again, you don't feel zone two and zone three. You can see it using good technology. So we can use the same technology that's created our aquariums. We can use that technology to fight against them. Um, so that's where that, that technology comes into place. Okay, so what would you classify then, something that people are probably doing that falls into that zone four, that either they either, either, either say, hey, you need to do less of it at more intensity, or you need to do more of it at less intensity. I have yet to have to recommend more ten- intensity. <laughs> that's e- anyone can go to the whip. Yeah, yeah. My as I've coached this over the years, it's about and you know what? I had a I had a little fitness facility here in this little town we live in called Granville. It was called Lemonade Fitness. And I had a lot of people come to me. It was a very technology driven facility. And I had a lot of people come to me that they wanted to run half marathons and marathons. And you're trying to teach them about zone three, zone four, zone five. And if they were a heart rate monitor, they were all zone four in their training. And I said, I need you in zone three, even zone two. And they said, if I'm in zone three, I'll be walking. And I said, then walk. Okay. It's do what it takes to get into the zone, to train at that level. All of them were successful. I've never had anybody miss a marathon time, half marathon time. Um, based on the fact now we, the other thing we did is I pulled them off the road. We spent a lot of time on a bike and just a little bit of time on the road, but we built zone three, zone two and zone three. So what would be one of your strategy, strategies, you know, let's say for someone who, someone who likes to run and we say, all right, now we, you want to get better at running. So we need to kind of pull you off the road, put you on the bike, you know, so now that time that you were normally spending, you know, let's say they were running 40 minutes a couple times a week or whatever, but they were running really hard for right. the 40 minutes. Is it now like, hey, because we're dropping them down into zone two and three or whatever the equivalent heart rate is, now instead of 40 minutes, they have to do 60 or whatever. Is there? A, you don't have it, to. Okay. You don't have to do more. And again, you can, there's, you can, there's no problem with that. Most people don't have the luxury of having a lot of extra time, but literally just ratcheting back for the period of time they normally run, there's a benefit. Again, we're taking cortisol out of the question. We're taking cortisol as, as a recovery inhibitor out of play. And once you do that, they'll start to see growth. You'll see your times at a certain heart rate. This, you'll see your speeds pick up. So where when I started, I'm running, you know, whatever, whatever pace, I'm running a five minute pace at a heart rate of 130. You do this for a month, you'll be running a 515 pace at a heart rate of 130. So my, on economics, I'm getting a better return on my investment. I'm getting more watts per heartbeat. Um, So learning to ratchet down and train in that space, there's just tons of value. And this is what we did at Ohio State. Um, You know, in 2015 and 16, when we started working, we brought in those bikes. And and once we applied this to wrestling, wrestlers don't need incentive to train harder. Okay, they go hard all the time. And they they were building up cortisol, they were building up these problems, they were not recovering, we were able to analyze that using another technology called heart rate variability. Um, but we were able to see that. And when we put in bikes where we could program the working level, I'm pretty sure we cut their run. We cut the amount of time they ran by almost 90%. You know, we spent a little bit of time doing zone five running late as we got ready for big tens. Uh, but most of the cardio was done on a bike at a programmed level, looking at heart rate. And all we did was see VO twos increase. We saw the ability to produce in- well, energy increase. And you, you'll be happy to hear this because this was something you and I used to butt heads on. But I've moved away from doing lots of running. Yeah. You know, so I, I still like to run. You know, I, I like to do my true sprint right, work sure. you know, on a track. I enjoy that more than doing the sprint work on the Aerodyne or whatever, although I do that sometimes. But, you know, I've moved away from – I still feel like running is a very important part. It's very, you know, primal movement. I think everyone Absolutely. should be able to run. Um, but I've, I've, re- I've moved away from doing a lot of the running, particularly the longer runs – not just for me, but also recommending it for my athletes. Yeah, you don't. Well, the, the other thing about running is not only do you pay a price with cortisol, but you pay a price with your fascia and the stress response on your fascia. Every time that foot hits the ground, you pay a little bit of a price. You don't have that on a bike. You know, right. we see cyclists out there for hours and hours a day with no cortisol and no fascia development and no stress. They're able to recover from this. You can't do that running. You know, so run, running's, running's rough. You pay a price when you run. Um, so it's important. So for any of the athletes that are watching or any coaches that are watching, if you want to recommend a, um, some resources about heart rate, 
for them to look at or if they want to get a monitor? What, what would you recommend them if they want to dig a little deeper into Listen, this? you can just start Googling training with heart rate zones. It's a good place to start. And, mm -hmm. and, and listen, I don't think there's a more important piece of technology for fitness than a heart rate monitor. Um, and so get one that talks to your phone now. You can get a heart rate monitor for 50 to 80 bucks, a, ch a chest transmitter that talks to your phone. And as you start to develop a portfolio of workouts, you go out and do your workout, you download it. You're going to see what zone you're in. You're going to see zone one, one through five. And you're going to start to figure out, okay, this is where my training's at. And it helps you make better decisions for moving through what are my next workouts. Because, you know, at Ohio State, my role as, was as a sports scientist. And, I, and what we figured out is what is the role of a sports scientist? Well, it's helping coaches and athletes make better decisions, giving them information to make better decisions. And we saw a ton of this stuff. And, and this, and, but you need data to make decisions with. And, and a heart rate monitor, I, I, I don't know how you train without one. It's, it's, it's a key element to everything I do. So Dawn, let's um let's kind of dig into what you got going on now. You got some interesting stuff to share about what you know. You talked about being in that third third, yeah. of your life. Now let's let's talk about what you guys are, have planned for the uh, the third third. Yeah. So interestingly, so when I left Ohio State, um, it it was hard for me to leave Ohio State. I that was not that was not something I wanted to do, but but it was you know I it, I was I did not feel welcome there anymore, even though I'm an alumnus and, and so forth. But I wound up, and I wound up going and working in cannabis, um, which, oh, by the way, has an incredible impact on HRV when you understand it. And then from cannabis, I was invited to go work with a company called Longevity Labs. Uh, this is an Austrian company. We have a product that actually works in the, in the autophagy cycle. It's called Spermidine Life. But as I've been working my way through this, my daughter, who turned 24, turned 24 in January, she'd played lacrosse at Ohio State and was finishing up grad school at Otterbein here locally. She moved out. She's now an assistant coach up at Northwestern University with their women's lacrosse Congrats. Program. Oh, it was so She's happy. an awesome kid. Well, I guess she's a woman. She's not a kid. I shouldn't say anymore. But I still remember her getting recruited to Ohio State. Yeah. You know, so I still think, uh, you know, her as a kid, as a young athlete or whatever. But yeah, she's a... Yeah. And, and she's out there doing it. She's out there doing it. And I looked at my wife and, and I love our home. The home we have here in Granville was wonderful. I had a great gym in my home. I put a sauna in, I had a hot tub. I had this place wired. And when Jacqueline moved out, when we were, where we officially enter third, third, right. Mm -hmm. Um, I looked at my wife and I said, we got to go. And she and I have been to Colorado on two different occasions thinking about how do we move there? Uh, the last time we were out there skiing and, um, we're, and I, again, I was teaching, she was teaching and we're looking at moving. Well, we found out we're pregnant. Um, and all our family was back East. So we, you know, we raised our daughter here. Well, that pregnancy moved out January 2nd. Okay. <laughs> so we don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, and I said, we got to go. And, um, so we looked at it and horrible time to buy a home right now, particularly if you look in the mountains, it's crazy. And I said, so let's let's not buy a home. Let's let's get a mobile home. Um, and we bought a 43 foot fifth wheel trailer. Uh, and we actually uh, we, we move out of our home this weekend into the trailer and we're going to go find our next homestead. Um, we don't know if it's Colorado or Utah or Washington or Oregon or New Mexico. We, we love all of those places. Um, we're, we're giving ourselves a couple years to go find our next home. Um, so and but our challenge was. How do I do fitness longevity in in a fifth wheel? And I bought a fifth wheel because typically when someone goes on a, in a mobile home or on an extended trip, unless they're like a, a psycho like me, they're thinking like, well, okay, I'm not going to work out because I'm going to be on this thing. Right, right. No, no. And and and, and again, I, I lecture on longevity almost on a daily basis now. So it's you know it kind of drills it in. How do I do movement and exercise? How do I do good food? How do I do light? therapy? How do I do sleep therapy? How do I do these things? What is my purpose? This is a big part of what I, I lecture on. And I, I said, so I've, I need a fifth wheel that I can put the modalities into. So we found one that I, I just installed a sauna in my fifth wheel. So I, I went from a five person finished sauna to a one person infrared, but I've got a sauna in my fifth wheel. We took the dinette out so the Peloton bike can go in. I've got my rogue uh, 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 ballistic block uh, in the back of my truck, I've got maces, I've got kettlebells, I've got a lot of rubber band style training kind of things. Bikes are on the back. Uh, I'm even installing my Concept 2 ski rower. 
um, in this thing so I can train with that while I'm gone. You know, this is my new home. Yeah. So I need to take the elements of life with me. So we, we found a fifth wheel that we can do this with. Don, I'll tell you what, man, that's super inspiring. Like I, like I said, I think that that's something that probably a lot of people dream of doing someday. You know, it's kind of a, a fantasy people have in their head of being able to like, we're going to pack up and get in this motor home and drive around and see the country and decide where we want to live. And you guys are doing it, man. So hats off to you on that. We're really excited about it. You know, I, I tell my, our realtor calls us about a week after we closed on the house and he says, Hey, I want to stop by. And, and he comes by and he says, um, we buy all our home sellers a gift when we close. And he says, you guys are impossible because you're trying to get rid of shit. And I'm like, no kidding. I mean, I mean, liquidating and we're purging right now, big time. But he gave us a pass to the national parks, a one year pass to the national parks. I love, I've wanted to do national parks my whole life. I, I love this. And now that's where we're going. I mean, we're going to pull this. I just, you know, with my work, I need a laptop, a cell phone, access to an airport. Um, we're going to go find out. We're going to find out where we want to live next. Well, I'm, I'm going to wake up and drink coffee looking at mountains regardless. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to do. I love it. Well, I'll tell you what, Don. So for you, while you're out here on the road, would people want to get in touch with you? Or if they want to learn more about yeah. what you do, how do, how do they find you? So the easiest way to follow me, uh, LinkedIn and Twitter. So I'm Don Moxley in both, at Don Moxley and LinkedIn and Twitter. I tend to push my uh, podcast works that I do. Like when this is eventually published, it'll wind up on my LinkedIn uh, profile. I tend to push information through Twitter. Um, we have Instagram that's Don Moxley on Instagram and Facebook too. But I, I got to tell you, I'm not a pro there yet. Well, we I, I was going to say, you're going to be doing some cool stuff and you're going to be in some very like cool looking locations you need to take advantage of instagram we're hoping i'm hoping i can become you know instagram's tough when you're talking about autophagy and longevity yeah, yeah, and stuff yeah. like that i mean there's not a picture that goes with that at least not and you know you gotta you gotta look good for instagram i don't i don't have that gift my mom said i got a, vo a face for radio so well i think you know I'm, I'm picturing you know don moxley drinking coffee with this sunrise in the mountains and the caption can be about autophagy. That's there you what, go. There, there's I'm your happy medium. Yeah, I'm good with that. So <laughs> we're figuring that out. Right now we're getting moved, uh, teaching the dog to, you know, the dog's been living in a ranch the whole life. We've got to teach the dog to do stairs. Um, so we're, you know, those are some <laughs> of the things we got to transition. Well, I'll tell you what, Don, I really appreciate you coming on today. I also wanted to say, you know, I appreciate your uh, friendship over the years. Look forward to kind of following your adventures. And uh, you've been a big help to me. You were a big help to me down in Ohio State. You definitely you know, help me kind of start trying to think outside of what I already thought was, hey, just because I like this or I enjoy it or this is hard, you know, that's what I want to do. You know, kind of start looking at the bigger picture when I train athletes. So you've been a big help to me. I appreciate that, Dustin. I mean, that's in, in life. That's what I try to do is help people rec Listen, I think college athletics, I'll make a strong statement here. You know, I think anyone who is either a college strength coach a college athletic trainer or a college dietitian, and they think they're doing state of the art, they're kidding themselves right now. There is an entire industry that is evolving outside of collegiate control that is so far ahead of the that's so far ahead of the pack, it's ridiculous. You guys are part of that. I mean, you don't have some team doctor that's completely separated from you, limiting your ability to experiment and look at things. Right. You know, I remember back when we were working together, I come across this thing called blood flow restriction training. Um, I'm like, this would be huge for our people. When you start taking a look at recovery and overtraining, BFR is huge. I remember bringing this in, and I just got shot down. Well, yeah, the the, uh, the athletic trainers are never going to allow something like well, that. Well, six years later, they have it. They right, saw right. a paper presented somewhere. <laughs> right. And, 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 you know, what we know is that research is about 15 years ahead of what we call standard of care, what insurance will pay for. And, and, so, and if that's what you're calibrating against, you know what? It, it may be a good living. It is not state of the art. And this is the challenge that you have in that collegiate environment. How do you do what is really best in an environment that's just so dominated by dogma um, and not science? You know, you know, listen, one of the reasons why I don't think that that I'm there anymore is that I was challenging dogma. Um, we were creating data that says, yeah, maybe what you're saying isn't exactly true. And I don't think people were comfortable with that. All right. Well, I'll tell you, what, I think that's a good place for us to sign it off. Once again, Don, I appreciate you. Remember, at Don Moxley on Twitter and LinkedIn. LinkedIn, yeah. And if you want to find more about autophagy or, or this uh, spermidine life, S P E R M I D I N E L I F E dot US. Uh, dot com takes you to our Austrian site, dot US, brings you to the American site, so you can always get through us through there, too. There we go. Boom.